بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد advertise we're going to deal with some issues about a dawa in Allah a dawa giving dawa to Allah and in one shape form or fashion everybody here is giving dawa to Allah everybody if you're married you're giving dawa to Allah to your children say one thing you do another thing try to teach them and instill in them principles and ideas and ideals and you go against them and you don't practice them so you're teaching him hypocrisy your neighbors who are not Muslims who you work with and not Muslims who you go to school with not Muslims you're giving down a lot obviously in these four walls in this masjid we're giving a down a lot everyone on some level in some shape form or fashion everyone is giving a dawah in Allah. So it's an important issue. So I'm going to mention some things about a dawah Allah that really are critical, that we have to comprehend. Especially in light of the fact that some of you are giving dawah Allah in the classical sense. You're on the internet debating and discussing with Shiites. You're on the internet debating and discussing with atheists, agnostics, Christians, Jews. So you're giving dawah Allah. Some of you are currently involved with sisters, women who are not Muslims. They're not Muslims. And you're trying to win her over to Al Islam. You want to marry her. You're giving a dawah to Allah. You're giving your Christian wife who's with you right now, you're giving her family dawah in Allah. Everybody here on some level is giving dawah to Allah. So for those of you who are really engaged in the classical understanding of a dawah in Allah, this uh, class is really for you in that some things that will be mentioned are really important, like the administration here, those people who give the khutbah here. It's really meant for you, primarily. But secondarily, it's meant for everybody here. Because the Prophet, he told everybody here, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Bellihu Anni Walau Aya. Talk about me. Make a tabligh. Tell people about me even if it's one eye. And people can be Muslims, non Muslims, Arab, non Arabs, rich, poor. Tell the people. They could be on the bus, they could be on the subway, they can be on the airplane. It's a general statement. And he made an am. We just prayed. Salat the Lord. That Allah ordered us to do it, and that's why we did it. Because we believe in Allah, we believe in His messengers. We embrace that. Okay, the Nabi he said, Tell the people about me, even if it's one eye. So when we hear that hadith, it becomes an obligation upon all of us to tell the people who we are mixing with, and we're having ihtikak with them, we have to let them know about the religion. And it doesn't necessarily be, have to be because he's doing something wrong. It can be you taking the initiative to tell people about things. In a statement in an incident that was recorded by Imam al-Tabarani in his Mu'jam al-Kabir, Hassan and Hussein were in the masjid of the grandfather, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and may Allah be pleased with both of them. A man came and he started making wudu and he was making wudu the wrong way. But he was an elder man, a sheikh. And Hassan and Hussein were better than that man in the scales with Allah. When they saw him making wudu, they wanted to teach him. So they didn't just come and tell him, do it like this, do it like that. One of them said to the other, can you show me what you know about the wudu of our grandfather? so that I can see and the man was sitting watching he said yes so he sat down and one of them started pouring the water and he made the wudu of the Nabi now when the man hears this is Hassan and Hussein making the wudu of their grandfather all of that is going to open up his heart more and more to embrace what he sees these are the grandsons of Rasulullah Hassan and Hussein so they understand that. So their heart, the man's heart is open and they took advantage of that. Put in the one who you're giving dawah in the frame of mind 
to embrace it, to accept what you're saying. If he's not in the frame of mind, it's not the time to give down with Allah. Not like that. You go to a nikah. You go to a naqiqah. I went to a naqiqah yesterday. Some people were from Nigeria. And I love Nigerian people. And they were from the south. Those people are party people. Party people. So when we went to the naqiqah, and the people were eating, and I came, they said, Sheikh, give a talk. This is not the time to give a talk. People are eating mutton and rice. They're not trying to listen to you. You don't impose yourself on the people at this time. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud traveled and he came to the people and he gave them a talk. They said, MashaAllah, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abba Abdurrahman, we love to hear your speech. Hadith, ayat, and the way you are, we love it. Come out all the time. He said, Radiallahu anhu, kana nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yatakhawwiluna bil mu'idha. The Prophet used to give us these talks at different times, different intervals. Likulli maqam, maqal. There's a time and place for everything. You can't come at the people at the time they're having a good time. The lady was at the grave of someone who died and the Prophet came to her, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Nabi of Islam. And the lady was crying at the grave. A proof that the woman can be at the grave. She can visit the grave. She was crying. Her husband, her son, her father died. So she was crying. Rasulullah came behind her and said to her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Isbari wahtasabi. Be patient, lady, and you'll get your reward from Allah. Because she's distraught, she didn't, she didn't want to hear that. She said to the Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِلَيْكَ عَنِّي فَإِنَّكَ لَمْ تُصَبِّ مَا صُدُّ بِي Get away from me. You weren't affected by what I was affected from you. By it. Someone died. My husband died. Get out of here. Well, so let him stand over her and give her a hard time. He just left. Because he knows the lady's situation. The people came and said, Hey lady, you said that to the Nabi. What are you doing that? She felt sad because she's a believer. She went to him and told him, to make the i'tidhar. I'm sorry, Ya Rasul, I didn't know it was you. I was ignorant. When a person is ignorant of something in Islam and you're giving da'wah, he's ignorant. Take it easy. The one you're giving da'wah to is ignorant. Take it easy. So when the Prophet heard her and her excuse, he told her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Innama as sabru inda sadmatul ula. The time to have patience is when the problem first happens. <clears throat> so although he told that lady, someone died. They just died. So be careful what you say to people and be careful how you respond. The time of patience is when the problem first happens. His kalam was muwajjah to that lady. But he was given the jawami and kalam. Although his kalam was to that lady, this hadith is for everybody. The time to have patience is when the problem first happens. Something transpires between you and your wife. Don't say, you're divorced. Don't do that. Try to take it easy. Someone brings you some news, something happens. Don't have a knee-jerk reaction to it and respond to it. Because it may cause you to be nagging, sorry for what you did. But the point here, the point, the point that we're making is... Then Nabi looked at her situation. She's mourning. So at the time of the janazah, this is not the time that I'm a da'i in Allah, I'm giving da'wah Allah. This is not the time to give the relatives a hard time when they're doing bid'ah, when they're doing things. This is not the time. I saw with my own eyes young brothers who think and believe that they're practicing Islam. They're on the sunnah. And no one else is on the sunnah. They're on the sunnah. I saw with my own eyes how they were arguing while burying their father. Two brothers had different understandings of the sunnah and they were arguing. You go to visit the people and it's at the funeral and we're trying to give down to educate the people. And there's a lot of innovation, a lot of things that are going on. You as the one who's giving down, you got to take into consideration the time and the place. It's elementary. The point here is, we're all giving da'wah ilallah. 
And a da'wah Allah is like every other form of ibadah in al-Islam. <coughs> if you're going to give da'wah Allah, it has to be in accordance to the Quran and the Sunnah. You can't come up with no new, with a new form of da'wah. In order to appeal to the intellect of the youngsters today, I'm going to give da'wah Allah by doing what? I'm going to form a hip hop group. I'm going to be the English African American hip hop one. This one is going to be the Moroccan Arabic hip hop one. That one over there is going to be the Egyptian. And that one's going to be the, Lib the Libyan. And that one's going to be from Tanzania. And that one's going to be from uh, uh, Pakistan. And we're going to form our group. Five of us, six of us. So I'm going to get up there and I'm hit the mic and I do my hip hop in, in African American lingo. And then he does his. In, in, in the Moroccan way. He does his, and then we call that Dawah il Allah. Dawah il Allah is ibadah. It's just like Salat. It's just like Hajj and Umrah. Can any of you just go and make Hajj and Umrah the way you want to make Hajj and Umrah? You go to Hajj and Umrah, so you go and you decide to make a Sa'i between a Safa and a Marwa first. And then after Safa and Marwa, you go drink Zamzam water. Then after Zamzam water, you go cut your hair. Then after cut your hair, you make Tawaf. And you say, I perform Umrah. We're going to say, Kalla. You change things around. And that ibadah is thrown in your face. And that's because the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, anyone who does an action or introduces an action that's not from our deen, it will be rejected. It will be rejected. So the dawah has to be the right way. Those of you who are giving dawah to the atheist. The atheist is sitting there asking you questions about, okay, you tell me then, and you're sincere. You tell me, why is it that in al-Islam, you can't eat khanzir and the dog is nasty and it has a bad place? Why is that in Islam? And then the next atheist, he wants to know the question, okay, you tell me, why is it that the lady, her inheritance is this or her inheritance is that. And you, the one who's given now, actually feel and believe, you have to answer every question that he puts to you. You don't have to answer every question. You have to bring the issue back to the origin. And that is, hey, you're asking me about things, they're important, but they're secondary. <laughs> what I need to get you to understand is, the one who created you, is this one and that one and this one and that one. And we're with them talking about all of this other secondary stuff and they're just wasting your time. Now it's possible that a person can accept Al-Islam because of those secondary issues. It's possible. But your job and my job, your responsibility, my responsibility is what Allah told us to say. And we don't see the Prophet Wasallam overindulging in secondary issues, as you're going to see. He dealt with primary issues. But sometimes, sometimes, he would deal with secondary issues. Some man came out of the desert, and he came and he said, Ya Muhammad, he was a non-Muslim, Ya Muhammad, I'm going to be rough with you in my speech, so don't hold me responsible, not to a, to a khidm, but I want to know. Allahu amar kabihad al wudu. Then Allah order you with this wudu that you have in your religion, this wudu. Ya ayyul ladheena amanu idha kumtu minal salati faqsimu wujuhukum wa aydiyakum minal marafiq. That ayat in Surah Al-Ma'idah about how to make wudu. Did Allah order you with this wudu? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about this issue to this non-Muslim, Allahumma na'am. Yes, I swear by Allah. And he just didn't say, Wallahi. He said, Allahumma na'am. And that man understood. And that man upon hearing that he said, I should have la ilaha illallah. I should have Muhammad Rasulullah. Because being a Bedouin from the desert, he knew the importance of water. From it comes life. From it, their lives are sustained. Without it, the quality of life is going to be disturbed and interrupted. And based on that secondary issue, he accepted Islam. But you're not going to find many examples like that. So I don't sit here and say, never deal with secondary issues. It may be wise to deal with them, depending upon who you're dealing with. But don't be of those people, and this is the point, you're giving doubt a lot, 
don't be of the people who overindulge in the secondary issues and you never told the person about the primary issue. Why were you created? Who created you? How is he? What does he do? What does he not do? What is the benefit of you embracing and so forth and so on? As it relates to a da'wah Allah, first thing we want to mention Ikhwani, after that is there are a lot of virtues of a da'wah, giving da'wah. A lot of virtues. And from them is what comes to us from the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلٍ مِمَّنْ دَعَنُ اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحَ ثُمَّ قَالْ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better? Who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah and he does righteous deeds and he says, Verily I'm from the Muslims. This ayah shows as it relates to speech, the professor, the guy who won the um, Nobel Peace Prize, who was in literature, the best speech is the one who calls to Allah. When people start talking, when people stop talking, some people are saying the truth, some people are saying batil, falsehood, and some people are saying truth and falsehood mixed together. The best speech on the face of this earth is the one who is calling the people to Allah, whether they're Muslims or non-Muslims. And that could be you talking to your wife, talking to your relatives, Muslims, non-Muslims, your children, whoever. No one is better in speech. So that goes to show the virtues of a doubt a lot. From the virtues is, the best people, if you guys were to be asked in question, who are the best of Allah's creation in terms of the sons and daughters of Adam? Who are the best people? Huh? The prophets and the messengers. And this was their wadifa. This was their career. No one is better than Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Adam, Nur, Ibrahim, Isa, Musa. No one's better than them. And this is what they engage themselves in. Some of them had other vocations. Other vocations. Zechariah, Yahya was a carpenter. Other of them had other vocations. But the primary vocation of the Prophet's message, the reason why they were sent, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa alayhim ajma'een, was to call the people to their Lord. The main reason why they were created. So that's a little, and that's a proof of it's the best issue. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Addalu ala khaylim kafa'ili. The one who guides someone else to good is like the one who did that good. You, when you give da'wah to Allah, you teach your children, you give da'wah to people on the internet, whatever. You can be asleep in your bed in this city, Bedford. Someone got a hold of your talk here or there, your book here or there, your pamphlet, the brochure that you put together here or there, you had something to do with it. He's in India. He's in another part of the world. You're sleeping and it's fudger time, lure time at his place. And because of what you said and because of what he saw, he was inspired by what you said. You're sleeping and you're getting rewarded because that person was benefited by what you said. Is there any better life in that? I ask you about Allah. You are sleeping. You're on the toilet. Allah. You're in the toilet. Someone is somewhere else in the world. Because of that thing they heard, they saw, they were inspired by you. And as a result of that, they changed your lives. They made Torah. They came into the religion. And you get the reward. It's like our parents, those of them who die on Islam. The parent Yomu Qiyama is going to find himself in the high part of a Jannah. He's going to be shocked and surprised because he knows what he did in the dunya. He knows what he didn't do. He'll ask, how did I arrive at this place? It will be said to him, Bistighfar ibnik laka ba'damutik. You arrived here because after you died, your son, your daughter, kept making dua for you. And because of that dua, you kept rising and rising and rising. He's going to be shocked. How many of you have parents that have died, but you don't take every single day to say, Oh Allah, forgive them. Oh Allah, raise them. How many? So the one who gives doubt to Allah is like that. Yom Qiyam will find himself in a place, inshallah. He'll say, where did all this come from? Where it came from?
because there are people in China, you never met them, you don't know them. People in India, you don't know them because of you, if I lost the mission. They were inspired. They made Toba. They came to the religion. You informed them. That's from the virtues of Salaam, Adawallah. And they are many. Rasulullah was about to engage the Kuffar in Al Jihad, the Jihad of Fiqh. The Jihad of Fiqh. There's a jihad in Islam that we won't apologize about. You can't apologize about it. These people want us to be apologetic, Muslims and non Muslims, about jihad. I'm not going to apologize about it because it's from our religion. If you want to be a Muslim and you want to be a student of knowledge, the very first book we're going to tell you, we advise you to read Hadith book. What's the first book we're going to advise people to read? Anybody know? Don't be scared. Anybody know? Take a shot at it. Khatib, khatib. If we're going to tell someone, read hadith, expose yourself to hadith, what's the first book we'll advise him to read in hadith? Huh? Huh? The 40 hadith of an imam and nobi. You could tell him to read Bukhari. There's no wrong answer. 40 hadith of al-Imam Nawi, simple book. And in that simple book, you're going to get the hadith that comes وَذُرَةِ السَّنَامِ الْجِهَادِ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ The peak of the matter in Islam is al-jihad fi sabili Allah. So when the person starts reading the book, إِنَّ مَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَادِ He starts reading all of those hadith. بُنِيَ الْإِسْلَامِ عَلَى خَمْسِ مَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِي فَأْتُ مِنُ مَسْتَطَعُ He keeps going. Then he comes to this hadith. We're going to tell him, jump over that one because it mentions jihad. No. We're going to say, this is what you're going to read. So jihad is going to come at you, Muslim. But we say, learn about jihad in the right way, with fiqh and fahm, understanding, comprehension. Learn about it the right way. So the Prophet said, now I want to make a point, and it's connected to jihad, but I have to leave the point out, because I'm scared, and i got to be politically correct. Because if I mention jihad to the community, people get scared. Rasulullah was going to perform the jihad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he came out. He told the people tomorrow, and he didn't say inshallah. He said tomorrow I'm going to give the raya, the flag of jihad, to a man. He loves Allah and his messenger. And Allah and his messenger loves that man. The response of the companions was, everybody said, man, I hope that's going to be me. I hope that's going to be me. Because Rasulullah said, Allah and His Messenger loves him. And if Allah and His Messenger love you, you go in the Jannah. The next day, Umar, the narrator of the hadith, he said, I came out, I positioned myself in a strategic place in the assembly, I sat on my knees, I didn't sit on my buttocks, akramakumullah, the way you're sitting. He said, I sat on my knees. Not only did I sit on my knees, but I extended myself, so I'm taller than everybody else. Rasulullah so looked in the audience, he says, where is Ali ibn Abi Talib? Where is Ali? A proof he doesn't know the ilm al ghayb Because if he knew, he would know where he was. They say, Ya Rasulullah, Ali has some infection in his eyes. وَيَشْتَكِي minha. He has some problem. He's complaining. He didn't come out. Rasulullah said, go tell him to come out. Rasulullah came out. They brought him out. Ali came. Rasulullah took him and he spit in his eyes. The barakah of his spittle. The barakah. And he did that, and it was gone. He was able to see. Rasulullah said, I'm going to give you this flag. I'm giving you this flag. You're going to be the leader of the group tomorrow. you be the leader. He said, now I want you to go, and I want you to wage jihad, and don't look back. And he got on his horse. He started going with the people, and he stopped his horse. He said, Ya Rasulullah, without looking back. He said, Ya Rasulullah, ala ma uqatiluhu. What should I fight them? I'm fighting them. What should I do? He said, fight them until they say, La ilaha illallah. The point here is, the point here is, a jihad was legislated as Allah Ta'ala said, uqatiluhum hatta la takuna fitna wa yakuna deen billah. Fight them until there's no fitna and the religion is for Allah. That's what jihad is for. Jihad is not for the mere spilling of blood. 
just walking up to people and killing people and blowing up people indiscriminately, innocent people, just making fitna, fold up, confusion. It's not what jihad is for. So his dawah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is to take off fitna and get people to understand. Now listen to this. Before the Nabi, this is the shahid, before he sent Ali, he told Ali, I'm going to give you this flag. And I want you to go to these people and you should know. If Allah guides one man by you, it'll be better for you than the red camel. If Allah guides one man, you're getting ready to go to these people. If Allah chose you to be the reason one person is guided because of you by your dollar, that's better for you than the red camel. So if you can think of these expensive cars, whatever expensive car you can think of, if one person was doubt, was given guidance because of you, due to you, your efforts, it's better than you for, than that, that expensive car. That's from the virtues of a dawah in Allah. That when Ali goes, he's not just going to go and fight people like that. He has to give them dawah Allah. How many of you heard the book by the Imam al-Tirmidhi called Al-Shama'il al-Muhammadiyah? How many of you heard that book? This is a book that Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi wrote. And in that book is telling us about the Prophet's fold, the Prophet's beard, the Prophet's henna, the Prophet's ring, the Prophet's staff, the Prophet's sword, the Prophet's hat for jihad, the Prophet's hoofs, the Prophet used to like the shoulder, everything that, how he was, everything how he slept, so that the Muslim would know who his Nabi is. person comes to us and he says, I had a dream about the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, MashaAllah. What did he look like? You say he looked like a Chinese man. We say you didn't dream about the Nabi because he didn't look like a Chinese man. The companions explained to us how he looked. You saw shaitan. You saw shaitan. So the Muslim has to learn what he looked like. Is that dream true? Is that not true? What did he like? What did he like? Anyway, an Imam at Tirmidhi in this book, a Shama'il al Muhammadiyah. Everything you need to know about him. Everything about his person. How tall he was, how he was, he sweat when he was sleeping, he snored when he was everything. He brought a chapter called the ring of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he explained what his ring looked like and why he took a ring. And he explained as well, it was made from what? And what did he do with that ring? He just didn't wear a ring for a tazayyum, for beauty. He wore that ring to stamp that ring. To stamp what? The letters that he wrote to the kings. Accept Islam, you'll be safe. Accept Islam, you get the reward of the people and embrace Islam. So that was the first chapter, his ring. And then after he died, he gave that ring to Abu Bakr. After Abu Bakr's khilafah, he gave it to Umar. After Umar, he gave it to Uthman. Uthman was sitting at a well and it fell in the well and they lost the ring. And Uthman had the whole Muslim community, help me find this ring. And they looked for the ring, they didn't find it. Now the point is, the chapter that came after that, right after that, is the chapter of the swords of the Nebi. He has seven swords. Not one, two, three. He has seven because he was a warrior. And then after the chapter of the sword, came the chapter of his armor. He had seven armor. Seven. Not one, two, three, four. He had seven. Sometimes in the battle of Ohud, he wore two. Then after that chapter, the chapter of his helmet, his hat. His hat that if he gets hit in the head, as he was hit in the head, and the Kufar cracked his head open. They broke his tooth right here in the battle of Badr. He said, how can a people be successful who cracked the head open of their Nebi and broke his tooth? And then when they made Salat, he made Dua, Lana Allah. And he started mentioning those four people. May Allah curse this one, curse this one, curse this one. Allah Ta'ala revealed the ayat of the Quran. لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٍ أَوْ يَتُوبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَوْ يَعْذِبُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ ظَالِمُونَ you have nothing to do with the issue, Ya Muhammad. Whether Allah punishes these people who did this to you, or Allah forgives them. And Allah guided those four men that the Nabi made dua against. 
and they became good companions. Rasulullah doesn't deserve to be worshipped. Anyway, anyway, the point is, why would Al-Imam at Tirmidhi, because it's connected to this hadith of Ali, connected. If Allah dies with you, one man, it's better for you than the red camel. And then after that, fight them. How Allah? you got to give da'wah to them first. You don't just go and fight people, blow people up, kill people. They're innocent. They don't even know their religion. You have to go and give them I mean, Imam at Tirmidhi brought these hadith like this. The hadith of the ring, and then the hadith of his weapons of war. Why? To show the community, hey, Dawah comes first. He wrote the letters, and then he sent the letters, giving them Dawah to Allah. And then if they don't accept that, they have to pay the jizya. If they refuse to do that, then we raise the flag of jihad against them. By which hop, by which right, did you kill that person who didn't hear the message of Islam? Al-Jihad is not confusion like that. Al-Jihad is not crazy like this. If Allah dies, one person with you, Ali, is better for you than a red man. All of that shows the virtues of a dawah in Allah. And there are many other things, but because of time, we're going to move on. Now the question is, what is the ruling of a dawah in Allah, Mu'in? What is the ruling? Is it wajib? What is it? What's the ruling? The ruling of a da'wah <laughs> Allah is that in general, this community and the people in it, a da'wah Allah is farud kifaya. Some people have to do it. And if they don't do it, then everybody is sinning. But if some people do it, then it takes responsibility off of everybody. Generally speaking, everybody here is responsible for making sure that some people are giving doubt, which is a proof that you can't be a Muslim, a real Muslim, and you can't be a part of this community, this community right here, thinking you're going to be a passive participant. You just come for Friday prayer, or you come for this prayer, that prayer. You got to do more than that. What is within your ability and your means? Abu Sala, I don't work, so I can't give a lot of money I don't work, but I got manpower. I can help the Dawah by, I'm going to travel to Luton and bring the sheikh who comes, Ahmed Najashi, Nishashi. I'm going to bring him here. I can't give, but you can use my car. I can't do this, but I'll use my skills as the carpenter, my skills as the lawyer, my knowledge, everybody, even our women. We're not telling that sister to invite all of the sisters to her house to give dawah to those sisters, but we're saying support your husband who is involved with the dawah. Don't give him a hard time with all these other issues. Just remember your husband is in Bedford helping Islam to go forward. And you have a lot of hukuk that he's responsible for. But when you want to bring him to task and talk about him, talk with him about those things, remember, remember, Sometimes you should eat humble pie, bite the bullet. And I say bite the bullet figuratively. I don't want nobody thinking the bullet. But I always have to say that. When you figuratively say, and then the bomb went off. You have to say it figuratively speaking. So nobody thinks that you're talking about, hey, make a bomb, blow up the bomb, take a bullet, take the gun. When I figuratively speaking, the sister Nia is, my husband, he is the individual who... He gives a mu'ed, he's the mu'ed, the adhan. I'm going to religiously wash his thobe and iron his thobe so that when he stands up for that adhan, he's giving a good picture to the community. That's the niyyad. And that niyyad is rewarded by Allah. Because there are other people who are looking at the mu'ed, they're looking at his, uh, they're looking at his thobe, they listen to his adhan, they're inspired by that man. So as a result of that, that girl, she gets the reward. Everybody has something to do. That's the point. <coughs> so the hukum of a doubt a lot is that it is farud kifaya. Some people have to do it. What's the delil? Many proofs of that, but just one that's very clear in Surah the Toba. Allah Ta'ala mentioned, وَمَا كَانَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لِيَنْفِرُوا كَافَةً فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ طَائِفَةٌ مِنْهُمْ يَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ 
وَلِيُنْذِرُ قَوْمَهُمْ مِنَ رَجْعُ إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ It is not acceptable, it is not correct that all of the believers, all of you, will go out all together. The whole community, everybody will go out to wage war and jihad. Let there remain a group, let them remain back in Al Medina so that they can learn the religion. And so that when those other ones who went out come back, they can teach them in the hopes that the ones who came back would fear what they need to know. So the Prophet وسلم, never, ever, ever told everybody in Medina, everybody, let's go out. He chose certain people. Some, most of the time he went out. And sometimes he didn't go out. He said one time to Ali, Ibn Abi Talib, I want you, Ali, to stay behind and you're the wali of the community in my absence. Ali wasn't happy. He was a soldier, he was a warrior. He said, La Ya Rasulullah, I want to go with you. Not in disobedience, but he had hirs. I want to go with you. I don't want to be here with the, you leave me with the women and the kids and old men. I want to get busy. He said, how do you feel that you will be like Harun was to Musa? You'll be like that to me. Harun was the wazir of Musa. Musa went up on the mountain and Harun stayed behind to be responsible for Ben Israel. When Musa came back and they were worshiping the calf, Musa took Harun's beard and stood, stood his beard. Harun said, oh, son of my mother, don't take my beard. Don't do this to me. These people are going to kill me. Don't do this to me. So, you're going to be my wazir. But, Harun was a Nabi after Rasulullah. You will be like Harun was to Musa. You'll be like that to me, but... There's no Nebi after me. <coughs> so he chose Ali to be responsible. Can't send anybody out. Can't send. There's a companion. His name is Abdullah. What was the Mu'addin's name that was blind? Ibn Ali what? Ibn Ali Muktum. He was blind. He used to be one of the Mu'addin's. He was blind, he couldn't see. He was one of the Mu'addins. Rasulullah left him responsible for al Medina, a handicapped person. So even the handicapped person, he's not excusing our religion, he has some responsibilities. He couldn't see, and yet he made the Adhan. He got to be Amin to make the Adhan. And not only the Adhan, he was responsible, the Amir of the whole community. And then someone's going to come and our administration says, you're handicapped, you have nothing to do. No, 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 no. You have something to do. So the point of all of that, Ikhwani, is I doubt a lot is fardun and it is kifaya. If some people do it, then it, responsibility <laughs> is off of the rest. But this is a really important issue of Allah. The fact that the Nabi left people behind and everybody didn't go. It goes to show the importance of Taking precautions and not throwing caution to the wind. Rasulullah had a sword. He had a sword. And on his sword, it had a thing that goes around the hand and it had a, 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 a knob right here. Why do you think he had a sword that was like that? Why do you think? Huh? I so it doesn't come out of his, so it his hands. It's no big crazy answer. So it doesn't come out of his hand. Goes to show the importance of taking precautions. The utensil that you're using, make sure it's the right one. Rasulullah so used something, he wore that thing, he wore that thing, taking precautions. What's this thing about throw caution to the wind? No matter what happens, no matter how strong we are, how weak we are, how few we are, how many we are, the nataj, the results are with Allah. Let's just go do it. That ain't our religion. When the Muslims are weak and you're weak and you can't do anything, you as a father, you, just relax and fall back until the time comes when you have the ability to take care of your situation. Prophet, he took precautions. Ya ayyuhal ladheena aminu enfiru thubatan aw enfiru jami'a Oh, you believe. Go out and fight as dispatchments. 
your 1,000 people, go out 100 at a time. Or go out all together, the army. Go out all together, depending on the situation. Isn't that crazy? Ya ayyul ladina amanu khudu hidrakum. Oh, you believe, take your precautions. That's what the Quran said. Take your precautions. Throw in caution to the wind. Talk about Am Mutawakkil. Allah was the Imam of the Mutawakkilin. Rasulullah was the Imam of those people who have a tawakkul. And that's what he used to do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wadda kathirum, wadda alladheena kafaru, law taghfuluna an aslihatikum wa amtiyatikum, fa yaminuna alaykum maylatin wahida. Those people who disbelieve, they will love that you leave your weapons. They will love that you leave your luggage. Just leave it. And then they will come and they will decimate you in one assault. You have to take care of our precautions. And that's what that ayah is saying. It's not for the whole community to go out. Some people have to remain behind. Which brings me to a very important hadith, Ikhwani. This hadith, for those of you who are giving da'wah Allah, to atheists, agnostics, Christians, Jews, people like that. This hadith is one of the pillars of the hadith that tell us about a dawah, its importance, and how to do it. Sayyid Bukhari, a Muslim, Abdullah ibn Abbas, the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that the Nabi sent his companion Mu'adh ibn Jabal to al Yemen. Mu'adh ibn Jabal is going to come Yom al when Allah raises the people up. Mu'adh ibn Jabal will be holding a flag and behind him will be all of the ulama from this ummah. Anybody who was a scholar will be behind him and he will be holding the flag showing that he is the imam of the ulama. It's important. Rasulullah sent him to Yemen. He told Mu'ab, إِنَّكَ تَقْدِمْ عَلَى قَوْمٍ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ فَاجْعَلْ أول, أَوَّلَ مَا تَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَيْهِ أَنْ يُوَحِّدُوا اللَّهَ فَإِنْ أَقَرُّوا لِذَلِكَ فَأَخْبِرُهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ افْتَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسْ سَلَوَاتٍ فِي يَوْمِهِمْ وَلَيْلَتِهِمْ فَإِنْ هُمْ أَطَاعُوكَ فِي ذَلِكَ فَأَخْبِرُهُمْ إن الله افترض عليهم زكاة أموالهم تؤخذ من فقرائهم وترد على أغنيائهم واتقي مكارم أموالهم Tremendous hadith Don't give down until you study this hadith You read about this hadith So he's in Al-Medina and he's going to send Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Al-Yemen In Birmingham some of the sisters because we have a big community, I think we can fit about 50 to 100 of these masjids in our masjid. Allah We got a big community. Pakistani, uh, Indian, Bangladeshi, uh, uh, everybody is there. All of the Arabs, all Africans, reverts, white, black, everybody is there. So we have a lot of programs. Dawa initiatives. Dawa for people who fell off the deep. Dawa for our kids who are going the wrong way. A lot of initiatives. We have so many people, we need the help. Everybody get involved. One of the Dawah programs are for the Reverb Sisters to educate them about hijab and salat. Other sisters who are like them, who went through what they're going through. Because if the person feels he has another salik on his maslak, the way that he has to go. There's someone who tread that path. It gives him strength. Don't be of those people in this community where you have community members who are brand new spanking Muslims. Brand spanking new. But he feels by himself. And no one says, where is that guy? I want to ask you guys right now. One time a few months ago, a year, I don't know how long ago, there was a white guy. He had, he had uh, uh, tattoos all over himself. His ears had earrings. Where's that guy at? They, uh, they traveled, I think, to one of the countries in Africa. They left. They left I'm to Africa. I'm the, I thought you were going to say Syria or Iran. <laughs> <laughs> oh, alhamdulillah, I'm to Africa. And alhamdulillah, someone knows where he is. But while he's in Africa, wherever he is, is that for sure that he's there? And what did you and you and you and you, what did you guys do about that brother? Innam al-mu'minuna ikhwa. 
Verily, the believers are brothers. That's your brother. Did you know his name? Did you invite him over? Did you go out? When the guy feels like he's by himself, that will cause sometimes some intikas. Cause a person to think, uh, I'm not on the right way. Anyway, anyway. In this hadith of Mu'ad, Ibn Jabal, radiallahu anhu, in Birmingham, they asked my wife, we want you, sister, to come and teach the reverse sisters how to pray. I have this issue of, okay, I don't want my wife being in a position of giving da'wah in Allah and being yomul piyama. She has to stand before Allah for overstepping her boundaries. But I can't kill her spirit as well. I have to tell her, look, you have a month to get it ready, inshallah. Get serious and prepare it and get it ready. Your wife and my wife, they're different sides of the same coin. I can't kill her spirit. I have to blow into her spirit. Just get ready. Anything you need from me, you ask me. Just get ready. Believe in it. You go and you bring the noise. So because she didn't study, because she didn't graduate, doesn't mean that my wife, all she can do in helping the dollar is support me when I travel, make me a sandwich on the day that I travel. Make it easy for me when I get back. No. She herself can get involved. There's a new sister Muslim over there. Support her. Bring her to your house. Give her some food. Talk to her. Sometimes the person <laughs> who need is some kalab, some support. The point is, everybody has to do something. So, in the of Mu'ad ibn Jabal, Rasulullah said, you're going to go to a people, I'm sending you to a group of people of Ahlul Kitab, the Jews and Christians. They're not Sikhs, Hindus, atheists, as agnostics. They're Christians and Jews. So make the first thing that you invite them to, La ilaha illallah. Not, why is khazir haram? Why is riba haram? He didn't say that. What's the importance of water? He didn't say that. What are the fawaid of the stars in the sky? Scientific proofs that show that the Quran is from Allah. He didn't tell him that. Although all of that is important and it has its place. He said, make the first thing you invite them to. La ilaha illallah. And then, and then, if they accept that, let them know that Allah made it wajib that they pray five times a day, in the day and the night. Fajr, dhur, as, maghrib, isha, every day. And if they accept that, let them know that zakat is wajib. And what zakat? That the money is taken from their rich and given to their poor. Given to their poor. And, Mu'ad, when you take their money, stay away from the best money that they have. Those of them that have camels, don't go take the biggest camel. Those of them that have sheep, don't take the biggest sheep, the strongest sheep. Take from them their wealth, but take from them what is moderate. Because you're going to make the people hate you, hate the dawah, hate the religion, if they have to give you the best of what they have. I don't understand it, Khwani. I don't understand. Many of these people who are doing these amaliyat and they're doing actions in the name of Islam, they don't understand the falsafa, if you will allow me, the philosophy that's beyond, behind the halal and haram in Islam. Their thing is, they make turkeys on... I just got to see blood on the ground. I got to see legs all over the place. The more damage and chaos that I can create, that's the proof that I'm a fattest. That's the proof that I'm a mujahid. When in fact, the faqih, he's the one who doesn't want to see blood on the ground. He wants to save the lives of the people. That's his goal of his objective. If I came and this man has camels, I took the best of his camels. He's going to be upset. Oh, why you got to get the best of what I have? Let's take what is moderate. This hadith, it shows you the arkan of the Tao, the pillars that the Tao is predicated and built upon. The first pillar is the Da'i, the one who's giving Tao to Allah. Mu'ad ibn Jabal. Rasulullah didn't choose that. Bedouin who came to the masjid, he pulled up his clothes and he urinated in the masjid. And he put Najasa in the masjid, in front of the people. 
You're sitting there, and he pulled up his clothes, pulled down his clothes, and went to the tomb and looked at everybody. Why do you think Rasulullah didn't send him, and he's a companion, Rabbi Allah, why do you think he didn't send him to Yemen? Why do you think? Anybody? Jim. Huh? Jim. Because he's ignorant. Radhi Allah anhu. Mu'adh ibn Ujabal is coming Yom al with the flag and he's the Imam of the ulama. He's knowledgeable. And this is one of the criticisms and one of the problems with the group Jamaat al-Tabliq. When I became a Muslim, I'm looking for the truth and I saw those brothers and I went to those brothers because they had some things that the group that I became Muslim with, they didn't have. I became Muslim with some people who were African Americans. They used to be Nation of Islam, Kufar, Elijah Muhammad, Louis Farrakhan, where Muhammad Ali Clay used to be. And then they became real Muslims, but they were very ignorant. And I became Muslims with them. They didn't pay attention to the Sunnah. They didn't pay attention to Salah. They didn't know anything. They didn't know anything. And I knew these guys don't know what they're talking about. But when I found Jamaat Tabli, they were Arabs, mostly Pakistani, Bangladesh. I went with them and I saw they were doing more of the Sunnah. They appreciated more of the Sunnah. But as time went on, I realized these people are ignorant. Ignorant people are giving dollar to ignorant people. And I don't say that to put them down. That's the reality. I don't say that to put them down. So if you ever meet those brothers or you are interested in going with those brothers, everybody who's given Dao is not necessarily the right guy. This Dao is about knowledge. Weighing the benefits and the harms. Knowing how to do and what to do. So the point here is, Mu'ad is the first pillar, the Dai. He has to know what he's doing. He has to be able to speak the language of the people, understand the people, and they understand him. He can't be a person who doesn't know the people. In Surah Ibrahim, Allah Ta'ala mentioned, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ Every prophet, every messenger went to his people speaking their language. I was in Kuwait a few weeks ago, and in Kuwait I gave a khutbah on Friday. Kuwait is a country that speaks Arabic. But there are two messages over there where English-speaking people can go to listen to the khutbah every week in English in an Arab country. And then over here, the language is English, and they make the khutbah in Arabic. They make the language in Somali, in Urdu, in the language that the people don't understand. It's backwards. Go to the Arab world, you would think the khutbah would be in Arabic, because that's what the people understand. No, there are two messages for the people to know what the Imam is saying. You come over here, in the language, in the country, the language is English, and we come to the message of the guy speaking in Urdu. And you're looking at him saying, what is this guy talking about? Even in Greenland, our message was built by Pakistani people. It was started by Pakistani people 33, 35 years ago. Pakistani people from Adil Adi, from Mirpur, Pakistan. They started that message. A lot of the elders don't know English. So now one of the elders died last week. We go to the Janazah. The Imam, he starts to talk to the people in Urdu about how the Salat of Janazah is going to be spoke, going to be prayed. And the non-Urdu speaking people are sitting there saying, man, what is this, man? Well, what are you talking about? Talking to us in this language. Speaking to us in Urdu. We have these elders. Enough of them know, because they've been Muslims long enough, they know how to do the janazah. And also, many of them know if you speak in English, they can figure it out. But the vast majority of people here, Somalis, Africans, reverts, we don't know what you're talking about. You're catering to only a small segment of the community. You're solving and addressing a small problem. It's backwards. So the guy has to have all of those characteristics. Someone says to me, I'm African American, I'm from America. Do you guys know what cot is? You guys know what cot is? If you know what cot is, put your hand up. Q A T. Cot. Cot. For yeah. Cot. Yeah. Yeah, for chewing. Yeah. I'm living in America. I don't know nothing about no cot until I start mixing with East Africans and Yemenis. Then I come to know a cot. Someone asks me, they say, what's the ruling of cot? I can't say halal or haram. I don't even know what it is. I say, tell me what it is. 
They say it's like grass. Grass is halal. What do you mean? They say, no, 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 no. You put the grass and you make a big thing in your mouth and you, <laughs> you have it in your mouth like that. It's okay. I wouldn't do that because the person is not a cow or some <laughs> mawashi. But it's halal. Oh, hold up, hold up. You put it in your mouth and it's real big like that and you talk and you, you smoke cigarettes and at night you give you talking and it keeps you up all night and it's in. I said, oh, that's haram. Like that is haram. Because now I know what he's talking about. And that's why the way of Al-Usul, Ikhwani, they say, Al-Hukum ala shayin far'an tasawwiri. Al-Hukum ala shayin far'an tasawwiri. In order to give a judgment about something, you have to know what that thing is. Don't just judge something haram, halal, and you don't know what you're talking about. Is he a good person, a good person, bad person? Yes, good, bad, no. You don't know what you're talking about. If you don't know, just be quiet. Just be quiet. So the da'i, you're giving da'wah, you don't know what you're talking about. So stay in your lane. Talk about what you know. And leave what you don't know. Don't go beyond that. Simple as that. Talk about the ayat that you know about. Talk about what you know. And take it easy. Even if it's Tell about me even if it's a small thing. This hadith of Mu'ad also shows Ikhwani, the second rukun from the arkan of a da'wah that is al-mad'u'un the people were being called to. <laughs> Verily, you're going to a people from Ahlul Kitab. You have to know who you're giving dawah to. You have to know who you're giving dawah to. Is he educated? Is he not educated? Is he a racist? Is he not a racist? Is he, does he believe in God Aslan? Or he doesn't believe in God at all? Because knowing who you're giving dawah to will determine how to give dawah. You have three children. And you're trying to educate them. They're not the same. This one is a girl. And she's the eldest. And these two are boys. The color is like that. His color is like this. And you have to make the dawah according to that. Can't give dawah to everyone the same way. This one right here. He has power. Position. And that one doesn't have power and position. This one has been oppressed. And this one is the oppressor. All of those issues. Dao is not the same, because what works for him doesn't work for him. And this is another reason why a jihad has been legislated. Some people, if you tell them as a person, you tell them, hey, listen, all of you guys, don't cross this line. Because if you cross this line, I'm going to deal with you. You and I, we're going to have a problem. I'm going to deal with you. There's that person who hears what you have to say, and he says, man, that guy seems serious. I ain't crossing that line. And he lives his life, his life beyond that line. But there is someone there who's going to say, now I'm going to cross that line. I'm going to see how it's going to go. <laughs> That's how people are. Because they only understand one language. And that is the language of hitting him in his head. That's the only language. That husband, the only language he'll understand is not if the girl comes to the community and tells the imam, and hey, you brothers, please talk to him so he can give me my hook. Stop oppressing me. Da -da 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 -da. He doesn't understand that language. So what she has to do is she has to go straight to the popo. She has to go straight to the popo. Because that's the only language she understands. Now someone sitting in the order saying, audience I will say, I will say, go to the popo. I'm telling you, try to solve the problem and don't go to the popo. But there are some people that's all they understand. She got her eye socket knocked out. She got her ribs broken. And she goes to that local imam, that traditional imam, and he says to her, like the prophet said to the lady over the grave, Isfari wa tasabi. Be patient and get your reward. No, 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 there's no patience here. You gotta go to the Pope, because that man gotta kill you. For an example, you only understand that language. So the point here is, we have to know, Ikhwani, who we're giving dawah to. We're in the UK. And in the UK, I told you from this member, and no one has challenged me up until this point, the UK are not like any other people. 
on the face of the earth from these non-Muslims. They are the most tolerant of the people. So based upon that, our dawah to this society should be indicative of the environment that we're living in. In some of these other countries in Europe, maybe our dawah is going to be underground. Maybe some of our dawah is going to be less, more subtle because of what the challenges are. You have to know who you're dealing with. She's a revert, Ahi. She's a revert Muslim. He's a revert. This one is from East Africa. That's one from West Africa. That's one from South Africa. This is an Arab who comes up. We have to know. And then number three, last pillar of the arcana of a dawah is the moldor of the dawah, the subject matter of the dawah. What should the dawah be? Hey, Mu'ad, make sure the first thing that you call to is La ilaha illallah. Call them to that. So how am I going to call people to La ilaha illallah if I myself, I don't understand what is the la, meaning of la ilaha? Ma ma'naha? Wa ma madlu la tuha? I don't know what it means, what it points to. I don't know what's connected to it. La ilaha illallah is the miftah of al jannah. It's the key that will get you into jannah. Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhla al jannata yawman min dahrihi. Or nafa'atu yawman min dahrihi. Anybody who says this word, it's going to benefit him one day. You may have to go to the hellfire, you may not, but you're going to go to Jannah. Okay. Have any of you ever seen a key that didn't have teeth on that key? La ilaha illallah has some teeth on it, it has some conditions connected to it. You have to know the meaning of it. You have to know what it implies. That doesn't mean you have to be a scholar of aqidah or anything like that. But don't be a person who has khurafat. You don't know what are you dawa, giving dawah to. The Yemeni's man or that individual, he comes and he's traveling in the Muslim world where Jews and Muslims live together, like in Yemen and other places. You have Muslims living there, like in Morocco. Muslims living there and Jews live in Morocco. We have any Moroccans here, any Maghreba? Are they Yahud in Morocco? From a long time ago. They live in Morocco, many places. The man is traveling with his animals and he has to go through the two mountains and he goes and he meets the Yehudi and the Yehudi has this thing and this thing. He knows the Yehudi. And it's in a deserted place. Deserted place. Nobody's there but this Muslim and that Yehudi. And the Muslim Moroccan or the Muslim man, he pulls out his knife. He pulls out his gun, whatever. He says, Sayyidah, he said, you're going to become a Muslim. You better become a Muslim right here. You better become a Muslim right here. You're going to fall right here dead. That man says, okay, 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 okay. And this happened with these crazy people in Daesh. This happens with them. You better say, you better become a Muslim right here. Oh, okay, 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 okay. What I have to do? What I have to say? What I have to do? He said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The man from Daesh, I don't know, guys, you can look at this on the YouTube. Three or four big lorries, big lorries came and they stopped the truck. They stopped the trucks, pulled the drivers down, and you can see a roar up with those drivers. And that guy who had the gun, the main one, I forgot his kunya, but it's written on me. He was one of the famous mujahideen of Daesh. Jazah, butcher, real butcher started asking him, you're Sunni or Shia? Those guys were, I mean, they could look and tell. He doesn't know if I say Sunni, maybe he's Shia. If I say Shia, maybe he's Sunni. But the guys knew, this looks like Daesh. They were scared. They said, we're Sunni, we're Sunni. They took their Hawiya, their um, ID cards. Their names, Hassan this, that, Ali this, that. You know, Shiite names. And they, you can see it, they put, they took a picture of it. So they started testing them, the drivers. How many rock out for Fudger? The guy said, three. <laughs> he said to the other one, he said to the other one, huh? what's the names of the wives of the Russell? He only can name two, and he didn't name Aisha, because Shiites don't like Aisha, and he didn't name her, but he only can name two. They're 11, he only named two. 
This one over here. What's the Adhan? He didn't know the Adhan. Yalla, 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 let's go. They took him off of the road, laid him down, pow, 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 and started blasting him. Hey, 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 what, what is that? Even if they're Shi'i, they're not people who are fighting against you. Why you kill those people? Even if they're Shi'i, why you kill those people? What jihad is that? I mean, where is your understanding of Islam? They're just regular people driving a truck, doing their job in a tough situation, trying to make money for their mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, and their children. By which hawk did you take their lives like that and then make takbir about what you did? You are a butcher. So when that went around, the people of Iraq, they knew, the Shiites started knowing. If they came and they say, you're not a Muslim. The man said, okay, 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 okay. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah. Ashadu wa Muhammad Rasulullah. He said, we don't accept that from you. Pa, 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 pa. What is that? Usama bin Uzay is fighting the man, and the man is fighting against Rasulullah and the companions. Usama bin Uzay knocks that man down. He gets over, he gets ready to stab the man. He says, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah. He didn't even say Muhammad Rasulullah. He stabbed him, killed him. The news went to the Nabi. Rasulullah said, Ya Usama, what are you going to do Yomu Qiyamah with La ilaha illallah? Ya Rasulullah, he only said it because I was getting ready to get him. He was trying to kill me. If the tables had been turned, he would have killed me. He said, what are you going to do with La ilaha illallah, Yomu Qiyamah? Ya Rasulullah, that man was trying to kill me. He only said that because he was just trying to get off the hook. Ya Usama, what are you going to do with La ilaha illallah, Yomu Qiyamah? You know what Usama said? He said, after the Prophet said it that many times, I wish that I had embraced Al-Islam on that day, at that moment, because I felt so low. I felt like, oh, I'm in trouble. Whereas the Muslim today, he just says to a Muslim who his Islam is clear, he's praying, he's doing things, you can see, but because he doesn't agree, he says, you're a kafir. And then after that word, the knife comes out, the sword comes out, and it's permissible to blow them up. We're going to try to get the non-Muslims, but if any Muslim is in the crowd, Allah will raise them up with his niyyah, based on his niyyah. And you call that da'wah ila Allah? That's da'wah to Allah. That's da'wah to fit them for sad. That's da'wah to food. So, Ikhwani, learn, inshallah, as much as you can learn about the deen of Allah, and... Stay in your lane. Don't become bigger than what you are. Just stay in your lane. And don't be of the people who make things <coughs> difficult for yourselves, make difficult things for the other people. Our religion is simple. Our religion is not complicated. But everything is predicated and built upon knowledge. So we're going to stop here, inshallah, as a gentleman. And uh, if you brothers have any questions, We'll deal with the questions that you may have connected to the dars. If you don't have any questions, for be with ni'mat. And if you also have any ta'liqat or taswibat, min haqqat inshallah, and tusawla, awal tu'allam. Awal tu'allam. Anindu kum shi'ah.